thin people who think they're okay because they don't look overweight, yet on the inside, there's a very different story. And I wonder if I could just frame that around the statistic, which I've heard before, you've written about it in your book, that 88% of Americans have a degree of metabolic dysfunction. But I also love the way that you describe metabolic syndrome. The, you know, Maybe you could describe how you say it, because I think it's a beautiful, beautifully simplistic way of looking at it, and then put it in the context of that thin person who thinks they're doing okay. So here's the problem. Everybody thinks that the scale tells the truth. The scale tells you how much you weigh. Who cares? Seriously, who cares? And here's why the scale lies. Because there's not one fat depot. There are three. Three separate fat depots. And they contribute differentially to your health. Here they are. First one, the one you can see. The subcutaneous fat. The big butt fat, as it were. As in, do these genes make me look fat? <laughs> and never answer that question. <laughs> yeah. Bad idea. Turns out the subcutaneous fat, while potentially cosmetically undesirable, is metabolically inert. Our subcutaneous fat is there very specifically to store energy for periods of famine. Right? And it has an innate expansive capacity to a certain point before it gets into trouble. In fact, you can basically put on about 10 kilos of subcutaneous fat, about 22 pounds of subcutaneous fat before you will have overexpanded those cells. Those cells will then have choked off and died, will have released their grease into the area, will have recruited macrophages in to clean up the grease, and will then have released cytokines into the bloodstream, which will, by the way, go into the systemic circulation. So you have to have a lot of grease in order to get a concentration high enough to go back to the liver to activate the cytokine response in the liver and cause um, insulin resistance. So 10 kilos of subcutaneous fat before you get sick. That's depot number one. Depot number two, the visceral fat, the belly fat. Okay, the, you know, beer belly, if you will, fat, right? Now that fat turns out not to be from beer. That fat turns out to be from stress. From stress. You know a lot about stress. That fat in your belly fat, okay, visceral fat, is due to cortisol. And cortisol is because our, our world is now overly stressful and people are overly stressed like all the time. So how do we know that? And the answer is because we can take patients with clinical depression, endogenous clinical depression, suicidal depression, get admitted to the hospital to keep them from themselves, put them in a scanner, and quantitate the amount of visceral fat. Now they're losing weight because they're not eating. They're losing sub-Q fat because they're not eating, but they're gaining visceral fat because their cortisol is so high. That is metabolically active fat. And it drains directly into the liver because it drains into the portal vein, mm -hmm. not into the systemic circulation. So a small amount of visceral fat will generate enough cytokines for your liver to be able to see it because it's concentrated, because it's not being diluted over the entire volume of distribution of your systemic circulation. So turns out about five to six pounds of visceral fat before your liver gets sick. So for sub-Q fat, 22 pounds. For visceral fat, five to six pounds. Now, can you see five to six pounds on the scale? Maybe, maybe not. Now let's do the third fat depot, the liver fat. 
the fat in your liver turns out to be the most egregious because it's right there. It's causing the problem right where the action is, right there in your liver. Okay. It turns out only a half a pound of visceral fat. I'm sorry, a liver fat, half a pound of liver fat, wow. and you will end up with metabolic dysfunction and insulin resistance. Can you see a half a pound on the scale? No. Okay. So three different fat depots. So the question is, what makes the liver fat? Answer, sugar. Because of this phenomenon, the de novo lipogenesis that we've been talking about. So you are mainlining it right into the organ that is the most susceptible to the problem. Yeah. And you can't even see it on the scale. So there are people walking around with fatty liver and don't know it because they say, well, I'm thin. No problem, except they have a problem. And that's why 88% of Americans now have some form of metabolic dysfunction because either sugar or alcohol is causing liver fat irrespective of what it's doing the rest of your body. Yeah. With and they don't know it. That's the nugget of truth that people, you know, that, that doctors are ignoring. Of course, that begs the question, how can people find that out? I will say, because we don't have much long left, I don't want to be respectful of your time, that yep. in your book, there is a whole section on the various blood tests that you should go and get. Uh, they're very simple and actually very readily available. And actually, you did a beautiful section on you know what the actual values are, but also what's optimal, what we should really be gunning for. Um, Obviously, there's things like DEXA scans, there's waist to hip ratios that people can do. Um, right. But I guess, you know, from in my culture, a lot of people from my ethnicity are walking around. We, it's quite, it was almost a joke growing up. Like you'd see dads, not a joke, but you'd see, you know, dad's friends after they hit a certain age, they'd still be thin everywhere, but the belly would just start to um, mm -hmm. go out. But, but thin arms, thin legs, just that belly. And of course, you know, right. many South Asians do have an increased risk of toe feed, thin on the outside, fat on the inside and all those sort of things. But um, mm -hmm. I really wanted to highlight this because I think many of us think, oh, it's all right for them. They can eat whatever they want and they don't put on weight. It's like, well, wait a minute. Yeah, no, cosmetically, right. they may not be looking, uh, they may look as though they're getting away with it, but they may not be. I also yeah. just want to finish off um, on kids. You just mentioned liver fats. I've heard you say before that you've had to send two children at least for liver transplants because of that is absolutely alarming, Rob. From and soda drinking. From soda drinking. So maybe before we get to the final point, I just wonder if you could, there's many parents who listen to this podcast and of course, a lot of people can take the advice for themselves, right? I need to have a low sugar diet. I need to have a high fiber, whatever my preferences are. But with kids, like it seems to be quite different. Kids' meals are a joke in most places. It's like the adults can have proper food and the kids have the junk in bars and restaurants, right? It's the same in the US. Right. Chicken um, nuggets and French fries and a Coke. And so what is it doing to kids at this early age when they're having regular juices, regular soda drinks, uh, regular highly processed foods? It's not really necessarily about their weight, is it? It's about... Is it setting the tone for later on in life? And then what advice would you give to parents? First of all, sugar downregulates its own receptor on the tongue. So the more sugar, the less sweet. Therefore, you need more sugar. So it becomes a vicious cycle. That's one thing. Second of all, it still causes liver fat accumulation in kids. We you know, now show, have shown that 20% of children have liver fat unrelated to obesity. People, who, you know, kids who have died in uh, auto accidents, you know, um, uh, autopsies show 20% of kids have liver fat. 20%? And it's unrelated to their obesity, you know, to, to obesity. You know, so where did they get liver fat from? They never had it before. This is where. Um, the bottom line is that this phenomenon is also, uh, you know, the, the sugar is also causing changes in behavior. Now, we don't have enough time to go into this, but sugar inhibits an enzyme in the brain, in astrocytes, called glutamine synthetase. And glutamine synthetase is necessary to turn 
glutamate into glutamine, which then will go to GABA. Yeah. GABA is the inhibitory neurotransmitter. Glutamate's the excitatory neurotransmitter. So there's a balance between excitation and inhibition, and sugar basically breaks that balance. And so sugar has been associated with irritability. It's been associated with violent behavior. It's been associated with um, uh, cognition problems. It's been associated with dementia in adults. It's been associated with changes in the prefrontal cortex thickness. It's been associated with associated with uh, uh, problems in school. Uh, it's been associated with um, all sorts of problems. Now, associations, not causation. We yeah. are still working on putting all the causation pieces together. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm not here to tell you that sugar's poisoning your brain yet. But, you know, there's a lot of data and the data in animals is pretty darn good. Yeah. You, know, you yeah. really want to go this route, people? And you're not talking about just white table sugar. You're talking about the processed no, food. Talking, you're talking about the I'm fruit about juices. Right, uh, absolutely. I'm talking about the Capri Suns. I'm talking about you know the stuff that the the, the, the parents are putting in the uh, in the lunchbox. Yeah, and that that statistic: twenty percent of kids have liver fat. That's there could be parents listening to this who think my kids look fine weight wise. You know, so what's what's the problem with a glass of apple juice a day? Um, and that's the problem. Ex yeah, exactly. And so I'm not, this conversation is not meant to shame anyone. It's just meant to try and raise awareness of something that we both feel could be really, really helpful. Uh, Rob, I've got to say that, that if people want more and I hope they do, well, at some point, if we can get a second conversation, I'd love that. But the book Metabolical is, it's really thorough. It's really comprehensive. I really would recommend people who want to learn more about this to, to get a copy. Uh, I think it's something you can keep dipping back in and out of over time. I, I really do think it's a fantastic read. And you cover the planet as well in it, which we didn't get a chance to talk about today. Uh, just to finish off, um, this podcast is called Feel Better, Live More. When we feel better in ourselves, we get more out of our lives. And in view of everything you've said, in view of all your passion about this area, I just wonder if you could just leave my audience with some of your final thoughts and a few top tips that they can think about applying into their lives. No, the most important thing people have to understand is, and you say it yourself, so I'm, I'm basically trumpeting what you say. To solve a problem, you have to solve the cause of the problem not the result of the problem. Doctors don't know how to do that. And I can say that because I'm one of them. Me too. Okay. And I, did, I didn't understand that going through medical school and I didn't understand that for the first 20 years of my practice. I did what I was told. I practiced the way they taught me to do. I got woke. You got woke. There are doctors around now who are getting woke and they're starting to make some, shall we say, noise. They're being cast off as, you know, heretics and, you know, rabble rousers and, you know, troublemakers and whatever. And some of them have even gone on trial in their respective countries. Tim Noakes in South Africa, Carrie Fetke in Australia, Evelyn Bordeaux Roy in Canada. Don't know if there are any in the UK that have uh, had that happen. But the bottom line is we are undergoing a, a revolution in modern medicine. We underwent a revolution back in the 1930s, 40s with antibiotics where we thought a pill could treat everything. Now we're undergoing a revolution where we realized that was a mistake. It's time to rethink health. It's time to rethink health care. You can't fix health care until you fix health. You can't fix health until you fix diet. And you can't fix diet until you know what the hell is wrong. And what you thought was wrong was basically propaganda for the last 50 years. We've had to undo that. We've had to basically turn it over. We've had to re rethink all of modern medicine. And the, uh, for your audience out there, what I'm telling you is not everything is wrong, but a lot of it is. When I went to medical school in 1976, 
a very, very um, uh, uh, famous uh, clinician stood up in front of our class on the very first day. And you've probably heard this yourself, wrong. And he said, 50% of everything we teach you is wrong. We just don't know which 50%. This is the 50%. If you enjoyed that clip, here's another powerful clip that I think you are really going to enjoy. 